welcome to the Amplifying Center for Innovation video podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a WeBank certified life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase the importance of science advocacy, health equity, and influential leadership through conversations with senior leaders who will share their unique perspectives on their leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Dr. Jessica Grossman, CEO of Igenix, an early stage venture biotechnology company whose mission is to develop a first in class therapy for millions of people whose daily lives are limited by food allergies and other severe allergic conditions. Dr. Grossman and I both sit on the board of Dari Bioscience, a leader in women's health innovation. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show, Jessica. Thank you, Sophia. It's great to be here. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure. So I usually start the podcast with the same question, which is, what is your definition of scientific innovation? That's a great question, Sophia. Um, you know, I have now been working in the industry for about 20 years, and I think it's evolved and changed over the years. Um, but really, I would boil it down to using science to meet an unmet medical need. I'm a physician, and I feel that it's very important that we utilize science for the good of humanity. And look what has just happened with all of the scientific advances that have happened around COVID and the vaccines. And so I think as long as we're using innovation to meet unmet medical needs, we're in good stead. I love that. I think it's a testament for the physician in you because you're always thinking patients first. So thank you for that great uh, definition. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we both serve on the Dari Bioscience Board. So I'm curious to know, what is your policy on board selection and what advice would you have for early to mid-stage career women who are looking to secure their first board seat? Yeah, that's also another great question. Um, and, and throughout my career, I've been on several boards. I was on the Medicines 360 board before I joined them as CEO. And I've been on many different private company boards. Usually I select a board based on if it's something I'm passionate about, um, which typically has been women's health, as well as something where I feel like I can really give um, a, a service and contribute in a way that the company needs. Um, for Dare, you know, I, I had been, I've known Sabrina for many years, the CEO of Dare, who's amazing. I'm sure you've had her on. Um, and for Dare, I really wanted to join a public board to get that experience and to understand what it's like and also to lift women up so that we can have women representation on public boards, which unfortunately is still woefully low, but we're, we're chipping away. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. And you're absolutely right. Uh, Sabrina is going to be a guest on the podcast this season. And we're also going to feature a number of leading women's health companies as well. So thank you for that uh, advice. Really makes sense. Now, I'm, I'm curious. I'm always curious about a bunch of things. But now I'm curious about what inspired your interest in developing molecular therapeutics for food allergies. And how does it tie into your vision for hygienics? Yeah, so Igenix is is a different company for me. As I mentioned, I've been kind of a long-term career in women's health. I was trained in OBGYN. I'm a physician. Prior to being CEO of Igenix, I was CEO of Medicines 360, which is a nonprofit pharmaceutical company looking to meet unmet needs in contraception. Um, but I got recruited over to Igenix about a year ago. Um, and I was really intrigued by the science they're doing. We have a unique scientific platform for antibody discovery. We call it Seek Sifter, and we're using single cell genomics to isolate the very rare B cells that make IgE antibodies. Mm -hmm. And before us, nobody had done this before. I see your the, the wheels turning of the uh, immunobiologist <laughs> in you. Um, 
And so I was very, very intrigued. Again, it goes back to unmet medical need. Mm -hmm. People with severe life-threatening allergies, they have no options except avoidance mm -hmm. and an EpiPen for rescue therapy. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking to do is to take the allergenic antibodies, the IgE antibodies that cause allergic disease and re-engineer those into IgG antibodies, hence the name Igenic, um, right. to deliver a therapeutic. And our, our goal and our vision is, is that this therapeutic could be given prophylactically, monthly, maybe even quarterly, so that people could live a life without fear of having an allergic reaction. Wow, that, I mean, that's extremely well said. And, and I think you also sort of give us an overview of, of what you're currently doing at, at Hygienics. But I want to take it a step back and ask you a question I've always wanted to ask you, which is what inspired your desire, your interest in becoming a physician? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's that's a, another good question. You know, I come from a family of physicians. My dad is a physician. And so I actually always wanted to be a physician, I, you know, I have kind of my fifth grade journal and in it, it says, I want to be a doctor. Um, what was different for me is that when I finished medical school and was in my residency and was starting, you know, the career in day-to-day -day patient care, I unexpectedly felt like, oh, wow, I think there might be more out there for me in just day-to-day -day patient care. I love medicine, I love the science behind it, and I love helping people, but I felt like I had some creativity and, and I didn't have a word for it at the time, but I'm really an entrepreneur that has skills in kind of bringing ideas to life and uh, products into actual being. So I decided, which was very risky at the time, this was over 20 years ago, decided to take a leave of absence from my residency and go to move to Silicon Valley where I live now and start to, to see what else was out there. This was sort of in the time of the internet bubble and, and there was just a lot going on. And I felt like there's gotta be other ways for physicians to contribute. Mm -hmm. And that led to me, led for me eventually starting my first company, which was a invention that I had on a minimally invasive surgical device for fibroid tumors, which as you know, are the most common um, female tumor of the reproductive tract. And, you know, I just sort of fell in love with contributing to medicine through starting companies, writing patents, getting products developed. And, you know, that led over time to other companies that I was CEO of and other products. And, you know, one of, one of the great accomplishments at Medicines 360 is our hormonal IUD, which was designed to be affordable, meet access needs for all women, regardless of parity, regardless of BMI, has been used now in over a million women. Wow. And so I hope to do the same at Igenix because wow. what, what I see about allergies is allergies are really a family disease. Mm -hmm. And as you and I both know, as moms and CEOs of our companies is, you know, the mom is the chief medical officer of the family. And oftentimes a lot of the healthcare decision-making and, and healthcare activity falls on mom. And in the allergy space, if we can really help the whole family to live a life without fear of an allergic reaction, then we've really changed whole families' lives, which would be very inspiring. Well, you are inspiring. I think starting with your definition of scientific innovation, you talked about the fulfillment of unmet medical needs, and you have showcased that desire to advance the state of medicine, the state of science, through your leadership positions to date. So thank you for taking us on that journey. But with all the good things that come with leadership, there are also unique challenges that women in particular face within the biotech industry. I imagine fundraising and even leadership are, are going to be important issues that women face. So what coping strategies have you adopted over the years to sort of manage that? Yeah, I think, um, I think all CEOs and entrepreneurs, but especially women, need to be incredibly resilient, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you get, get knocked down, you get told no a million times, and you got to just keep going and believe in yourself, take risks, 
try to take care of yourself as much as you can because no one else is going to do it. Um, when I joined Igenix, I raised a $25 million Series A1 extension, which I closed, thank you, about after only being at the company about six or seven months, I closed it in July of this past year. And it was challenging. It was challenging to get out there right at the beginning when I was still new to the story, new to the science and raise the money. Um, but I was, you know, I, I felt really great when, when we closed the round. And e even in 2020, it's only about 3% of venture capital funding that goes to companies with female CEOs. And so, again, I feel like if I can be a trailblazer and help uh, set the path for other women and girls to follow behind me, then, then I should, that's my responsibility to do that. That's wonderful. Again, extremely well said. Now, I imagine over your, the course of your career from medical school to biotech entrepreneurship that you've had some notable mentors that have helped to shape your career journey to date. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, great mentors. I've been very lucky. Um, when I started my first company, I had a chairman who was also a CEO of a women's healthcare company um, that helped me a lot to really understand what it was to raise my very first venture round and help me kind of with the organizational uh, aspects of the company. And then at Medicines 360, my chair was a professor at, is a professor at UCSF um, who is a chair in pharmacology, and he also was extremely helpful. I find, and this is a, a little piece of advice, always you know, look for a mentor who has time for you and who can mm -hmm. be available, mm -hmm. and then check in with them often, go with specific questions. Um, and I would say at Igenix, uh, one of the co-founders, Steve Quake, who's also a professor at Stanford, has been really fabulous and, and a great mentor. And our other co-founder, Kari Nadeau, who's also a professor at Stanford, has been fabulous as well. So um, definitely have, have used and needed a lot of help to get here. And I also try to help uh, others as much as I can. I think one of the challenges is I don't want to overcommit and then not be available, but I do mentor some women as well. Well, that's that's wonderful, right? It's always great to give back whenever you can, but to the point that you made earlier, it's important to find mentors that have time for you. It's also important for you as a mentor to evaluate if you have time to mentor. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't, then maybe it's not a, a good time for all that to happen. Um, yeah. So, so we had just one thing to go back to your early question on how do you select a board? Yeah, I think it's really important, and I, I know you know this, it is do you have time for board right. service? Right, right. And and you've served on both for profit and nonprofit boards, correct? And and yeah. what would you say is the difference between both? Just out of well, <laughs> Yeah, for me, they were actually remarkable similar because Medicine 360, although nonprofit, are, operates as a pharmaceutical company. So they really weren't that different. But I think it's really important if you're going to, if you want to be on a board, which absolutely I think everyone should, that you really reserve the time mm -hmm. uh, to commit and to be available, to read the materials, et cetera. As a CEO, as a, you know, I'm sure you know, we spend a lot of time making our board materials and there's nothing more frustrating when you get on the, the call and, and, and some of your board members are like, oh, I haven't read anything yet, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So I only have just a couple more questions for you, Dr. Grossman. Um, and the next one is, what are some key factors that you think would be important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think with the COVID-19 vaccine, we saw really unprecedented investment interest, eagerness to be involved in the life sciences, to be involved in clinical trials. And, you know, that was essential to, to, for the speed at which we developed the vaccines. And I really like to see that momentum kept up. I think the FDA was very flexible mm -hmm. in keeping safety at the forefront, but also allowing um, 
companies to accelerate where safety was still uh, upheld. And so I'd like to see that continued. And then obviously I would like to see the continued investment, investment in women CEOs. <laughs> um, before I know it, I'm sure I'll be out there raising my Series B probably sometime next year. So if anyone sees this, <laughs> please come. Um, that would be great. But we need to do more in ensuring that people of, of every color, uh, every gender, different backgrounds are included in clinical trials, included in research, and included in companies and boards who, who serve the medical community, right? Because people come in all different sizes, shapes, and colors, and it's our job to serve them. Well, extremely well said. I, I was born in Nigeria, and whenever I think about health access or health equity, I get very interested because to the point that you made earlier, there are many millions of people in this world that need access to quality healthcare products, and I think you've showcased that over the course of your career. Now, in closing, do you have any other comments or thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, well, uh, first of all, it's been a pleasure to be on a, a board with you, Sophia. I think you bring a really wonderful, different, interesting viewpoint that we absolutely need. I'd like to see more boards um, get women representation and people of color, because I think, you know, until we can look around us and, and see real world representation, we're not really serving the patients and the communities in the, in the greatest need. Oh, thank you. Again, extremely well said. It's been an honor and a pleasure to serve with you as well. You're very astute, always plugged in, and always you have this grace around you. In my head, I call you, uh, I, what was her name? Grace Kelly. Uh, she was this actress, and, and like I, I just, anyway, that's a different uh, topic for another day. But well, I, I appreciate that because I think, I think also many of us with COVID, you know, we end up feeling depleted. We're on Zoom all the time, yes. we're working from our homes, and I, I definitely have felt over the course of the last two years that, you know, I just, I don't have any more to give. I'm exhausted. Yeah. Um, but as I said at the beginning, you know, just try to keep that resilience up, keep on going, keep showing up and good things will happen. Keep putting Absolutely. in the work. Absolutely. But I think it's testament of what you also mentioned earlier, which is around making sure that when you commit to things that you have the time for it, right? But I also think the world itself is becoming more flexible, right? Just in the way that we approach things. So um, thank you for what has been an insightful and really enlightening discussion. I look forward to staying in touch and I think I'll be seeing you again later on this week. So thank you. for Yeah, that. <laughs> thank you so much, Sophia. Right. A pleasure. Okay. All right, now, bye. <laughs>